Hello, everyone. Welcome to the third of the SADB podcasts. Uh, today, we are quite, um, it's, it's a bit of an unusual one because we've done countries before, but this time we have represent, representatives of Royal Derby in Hawaii. Uh, mm-hmm. So I'll let them introduce themselves and we're going to let everyone know how Derby works on the islands, um, including their two uh, tournaments, one of which is international. But I'll let them introduce themselves first. So, Aloha, I'm Heidi Doom. I live on the island of Oahu, and I represent Pacific Roller Derby. Our travel team is the Hooligans, and our team hosted Battle of the Islands in 2019. Delph, want to introduce yourself? Aloha, Delph Soja. From Hilo, Big Island of Hawaii, Paradise Roller Girls, and we are the host of Big Island Brawl. <laughs> Hi, I'm Whiskey Sourpuss. I'm here representing Garden Island Renegade Rollers. Um, the last time we hosted Battle of the Islands was my very first year of Derby, which was three years ago. Uh, 2017. Um, I might be the newcomer here, but I love therapy. It's awesome. Hi. <laughs> awesome. Aloha. I am Wonton Devastation, and I am here representing the Waimea Wranglers uh, Rough Rollers. We are um, the third team on the Big Island of Hawaii. And um, our venue is going to host <laughs> um, the uh, Big Island Brawl this year. And we last hosted Battle of the Islands in 2018. Aloha, I'm Dams. I live on the Big Island or the island of Hawaii. I'm with Echo City Knockouts. And this year, cross your fingers if all goes well, we will be hosting the Battle of the Islands. Hey, I'm Sasson, Sarah Gray on the screen, and uh, I live on the island of Maui, and I skate with the Maui Roller Girls, and um, I didn't do my homework. I can't remember when we last hosted um, (laughs) Battle, because it's always a really stressful thing for us, not having a venue, so I know that we're on the docket to do it in the coming years, and we're looking hard for a for a place to do that. So I'm sure we'll all talk about how challenging it is to find a place to skate. Thanks for having me. So thanks to all of you coming. Um, I guess as with all of the other podcasts we've, started, we've done, I start by asking to give a bit of context. Obviously, um, Hawaii is an unusual state. Um, it's the only state surrounded by water on all sides. Um, and obviously you're one of the newer states, the USA. So how did Roller Derby get started uh, in, in Hawaii? Do any of you, have, you, have, 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 have any of you been around for that long? Or are you, um... Yeah, I've been I'd around that long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it started, it started on Oahu, um, uh, I believe 2008, maybe 2007. Uh, our team formed in 2008 on Maui and we were sort of like right behind them or right in tandem with them. <laughs> And it's funny that we have so much uh, hybrid Maui team, or sorry, Hawaii teamwork where Maui is skating with other skaters and Big Island is skating with each other because originally our Maui team ended up being an extended home team of Pacific on Oahu so that we could have a season where we could have um, games against each other and then we could form a travel team that could skate under their Wufta um, uh, membership. Yeah, so on the way back, we were actually two becoming one, <laughs> and then we became more, and now they're sort of rejoining. So mm-hmm. 2008, around that time, is when it started those two leagues. And I mean, I guess being fairly isolated um, in terms of the fact you had to fly to get to Hawaii from anywhere else in the States, I guess originally the league structure was very much leagues on Hawaii playing other leagues on Hawaii, right? Yeah, yeah, we were always excited when there was a new league popping up. So yeah, was it um, who was next? Hilo and uh, and um, Kauai were pretty close to each other. Yeah, is that yeah. true? Yeah, um, Kauai started in two thousand nine, I believe. Yeah. It was 
slightly analogous to how it went for the Texas Roller Girls, where the person who started it wanted to make it a business, and some people kind of flaked off and started to form their own league. Um, and as far as I know it, yeah, Garden Island Renegade Rollers, I mean, it's kind of evolved over time, but it started in 2009. So how did you guys all get involved in Roller Derby? Um, I, mean, so, I mean, most of you aren't as old as your leagues, right? So how did you get involved? I started when I left Hawaii about seven, eight years ago. I moved to Florida and I played for a kind of a rec league, a party league in Florida in Daytona Beach um, to make friends because I didn't know anybody on the mainland. And uh, when I came back here three years later, I found Pacific Roller Derby, which is the only team on Oahu. Big Island's, Big Island's killing it with three leagues. Uh. I feel like they have a bigger fan base because of that. I mean, it's, no. you know, the teams ebb and flow. The times when the teams are bigger and smaller and, exactly. you know, Pacific Roller Derby used to have multiple home teams. Um, back in the day, they had like the Diamond Head Dolls and the South Shore Sirens. Um, our team's not that big anymore. And uh, we just have one, just our travel team, the Hooligans now. <laughs> It's okay, we have dogs um, in the background. We knew about that. It's fine. <laughs> uh, Why Mayor Rambler started in BAMS, was that June 2012? Yeah. Um, I joined, BAMS was an original member of Why Mayor. Um, I joined in November of 2012. Uh, and we started with um, players that had played on the mainland and had started with uh, Paradise in Hilo. And That's then. Cool. Um, and Echo and branched off to create a team in uh, Waimea. We have the least population of the three towns on Hawaii Island. Um, and our team is, we're not killing it. Like we're on, on the big island, we are in the process of merging all of the three teams into one team right now. Um, everyone's playing with Echo and um, our Waimea has shrunken down to hardly anybody. Um, and we were really doing well with our juniors, but mm. this COVID is killing the juniors out. Um, yeah. I started refereeing in 2013 and have been um, primarily refereeing since then. That's me. <laughs> So I started in 2012 as one of the original members of Waimea Wranglers. And I was hit up by Sadie and Chewy. They're the founders of Waimea Wranglers. And they skated with Echo and they skated with Paradise Roller Girls. And they did that, they branched off and did that because they were working at Domino's. One of our coaches owned Domino's. Okay. And so they started their own team. And they didn't know anybody. They're not Big Island girls. They moved to the Big Island. So I think what they were doing was just Facebooking anybody that they saw that lived in Waimea. I was one of them. And I was like, oh, roller derby, what's this? Okay, I'll go to the meeting. And I was hooked after that. So that's how I got into it. Eventually, I kind of evolved and went into Echo after we started that merger thing. And here I am now. <laughs> and Stealth, how about you? Paradise started uh, February 14th, Valentine's Day in 2010, and I, I signed up April of 2011, um, their rookie camp, and it was just crazy huge. It kind of like came out with a bang. Um, mm -hmm. Six skaters, they, we made three home teams. Um, it was crazy, um, and yeah, I got hooked just wanting to play a sport and get healthy and fit, um, being 35 years old at the time. And yeah, I just, just love the game and I love the sport and I love the camaraderie with the you know, Derby sisters. It was awesome, you know, they were friends, family, they became family. And it just, it was a great community for, for me at the time. Um, it was awesome. And so I stuck with it since then. Um, now we are just struggling to have one travel team. 
we don't we're, we haven't competed since 2018 2019 we didn't compete at all we had no team um so we hosted our big island brawl without being able to play in it mm. which was heartbreaking but we started talking about merge with big island with the other two teams um so we were talking about that and we were hoping to merge this 2020 season um but it suspended for now because we just don't have any team members to merge with so currently i'm on kona's charter right now just so i can stay competitive and play sanction games be able to scrimmage and compete yeah i mean so i mean we brought up the merger on big island a few times but i mean it's also the case for those of you i mean you have contacts with other teams across the world but do you feel i feel that roller derby in general in a lot of places where it started up quite early is slowly is currently declining slightly i mean certainly mm. in the uk i don't think we have quite as much derby as we did say in the high point around about 2012 2013 2014 right. um i mean do you feel it's, from what you know about other places do you feel it's the same kind of thing or is or is it different yeah. because you're an island and it's when we first started talking about merging because everyone's like why is there three teams on the big island and the reason is it's big enough that we really have to drive to get to one another um and when we first started talking about it people weren't really doing it and by the time we're doing it now there's woof to the teams wftda teams that are a precedent for us yeah. Because of that, the same kind of thing happening all over in Derby where there was an explosion of tiny little leagues that are now finding it better for financial and travel reasons to um, become one league. So there's a model for it now. Yeah. And I mean, it happened in, I mean, talking about islands, I mean, Okinawa did the same thing. Okinawa had two leagues mm -hmm. for a long time and now they have one. And the their home teams for that league are the names of the old leagues. So they've <laughs> maintained a kind of spirit um, I mean, have you thought of, I mean, I don't know how much you, you want to talk about the internal processes. But have you thought about how this merger is going to work? Are you going to become, are you going to have a, an, a name which isn't the name of any of the leagues? Or are you going to pick one? Or is this kind of stuff difficult, right? Because everyone's attached <laughs> to their own. There, there, um, how it was going to work is that we were going to be kind of like home teams under an umbrella. Um, which we, we haven't decided the name, but it was something maybe Big Island Roller Derby uh, is what we were calling ourselves for now um, for Battle of the Islands last tournament. Um, but we haven't decided on a name. And we, we've suspended talks about merging for now. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of how the stru structure was being proposed just having an umbrella charter to be under and we will act like a home team as far as our it seems needs. like it seems like for you guys that would give you some room too to incorporate if you continued the men's league or the co-ed stuff like there's a bigger umbrella to put all of those awesome you know arms into since they're all connected in a way right it's all the same people that are coaching and skating and roughing and making it happen so to have a mothership that you all feel connected to that isn't divisive in its name sort of makes sense yeah yep. exactly sort of like san diego roller derby and i think that's kind mm -hmm. of what that idea is there's just so many moving pieces right now that we need to figure out like each team has their own board of course and each team has their own finances and their own money and all of that needs to be figured out and that's going to take a lot of work like cal was saying there was no model so it's taking some time so right now what we're doing so that everybody could skate as stealth said is we have skaters from i'm with the kona team so echo so we have skaters from waimea and hilo that are on our charter that's what i was talking about in our message and we take everyone and we allow everyone the opportunity to choose if they want to be on the charter. And we don't just pick and choose. We don't say, hey, would you like to be on it? It's open to everybody. And on Sundays, we have the practices in Waimea, which Waimea graciously opened their doors to and allowed to happen. And it's 
sort of like the epicenter of Derby on the island. It's a central place for all of us to practice because Kona girls have to drive far if we went to Hilo, same as if Hilo had to go to Kona. So Waino is a perfect spot. And that practice is on Sundays where we have Grandmaster Smash, our coach for Echo, and he's kind of like the one that is setting the precedent for how Derby should be, how Derby should look on the island. He's coaching that practice and leading the way and then kind of coaching the coaches from the other teams as well. So is that's, Waimea, that's where we are. Sorry, is Waimea the only indoor venue on the island? Is that right? No, there's more. Kona uh, I know there's a field there. But you can't practice. So we about where to skate. <laughs> Shall we talk about how difficult it is to find places to skate? Oh, no, genuinely, yeah. we should we should talk about that. It's a it's I mean it's a common problem for a lot of people, but I imagine on on Hawaii it's perhaps because you're a Pacific island, it's perhaps interesting. So it's, I always assumed a lot of your stuff with that with outside. The video I've seen, a lot of your games seem to be outside. But let's talk about that. So Waimea started um on an outdoor um, basketball volleyball court um, on the beach. Uh, so we had to like turn the, the, the water away and we had to sweep the sand out and um, move the volleyball net and then chase away all of the basketball players who wanted to play during our practices. Uh, uh, we also started in a gym that has since been turned into uh, temporarily into a high school gym. Um, because they had water damage. Uh -huh. uh, and they had kicked us out of the Honoka'a gym. Um, and that's when we became really good at figuring out what everyone thinks about roller derby and why they think it's so damaging to indoor spaces. So we mounted this huge campaign where we got, um, um, <clears throat> we got um, letters from wheel makers talking about very soft wheels um, and we actually did a demonstration we um, had filmed the floor before we ever started on it and we filmed it when we were kicked out to show that we had done no damage after every practice we scrubbed out any sort of marks or anything we were taking better care of that gym than the rest of the community that was using it and then finally we did a demonstration where we um, drug our toe stops over the lines, and we um, did knee slides over the lines of the floor to show that there was no damage for us. Um, and we were allowed back into that gym in Honoka'a right as uh, the Waimea gym opened and they turned the Honoka'a gym into a high school gym. Uh, the Waimea gym was a brand new community um, area that has sport court on it. So we didn't have to do the same demonstration, but we're not allowed to leave our tape down um, mm. on, the, on the track. Uh, and we have to be careful of the lines that are painted when we pull our tape off every time. So there's a cost to us in terms of tape um, and rental to that gym. And I get very angry about all of this because it seems <laughs> to be, and I of course you know didn't say this to the county um, Parks and Rec, but it seemed like we weren't even proving that <clears throat> roller derby was a great community event that brought together a lot of people in the community that don't normally do team sports. Right. And a lot of people like um, sort of alternative children and older women, people that don't usually do <laughs> team sports. So it's an amazing community event, as we all know. Um, but we weren't trying to prove that. We were trying to prove that our sport wasn't damaging the painted lines mm -hmm. put down by other sports. Yeah. And that seemed really like, that makes me very angry. <laughs> and it does, um, seem a, it does seem a weirdly common thing to happen because it's not just in Hawaii. I mean, this is a really, common, a really common problem. I mean, I've even heard of people who have holes where people play roller hockey and who still got confused about roller derby, even though you'd think roller hockey would be just as dangerous if you got more to the holes. But, yeah, so. Yeah, we have that. So, yeah, we're the bastard stepchild of sports. And that's the unfortunate piece of it. And I don't want to say it's because it's mostly women, but in our case, I feel like that's been part of our problem on Maui. 
Um, we originally, yeah, attempted to play at the inline hockey rink that uh, has, hosts a public skate night three nights a week. They're required to because their leasehold is owned by the county. They pay, from what I understand, I'm not in their personal business, but from what I understand, they don't pay really any rent so long as they provide a community venue. But when we have approached them multiple times, uh, we've been strong armed out of there. And I get that 12 years ago, they didn't like our approach, um, but we have been a different organization since then with different people. Um, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. We now our home is the Boys and Girls Club. So, I mean, we're definitely family friendly in a lot of ways, but um, uh, we've had to force our way through the county to be allowed to use the hockey rink on a couple of occasions and it felt like such an imposition on them and we felt so um, uninvited that we didn't want to be forcing our way into any venue. It doesn't really make sense. But what makes even less sense is why there's a hockey rink that's empty many, many hours of the day every day and we're not allowed to use it for a roller sport. So. Yeah. You know, you know what I'm yeah. into. Yeah. It's frustrating. And when, you, um, and when you hosted Battle of the Islands, uh, you got into a, a gym, but they said something about they were worrying about the trucks of our skate. Well, then we had to borrow the, the sport, sport court from, a lot, or from Big Island, which was like the biggest hassle ever on the end of the poor people who had to put it together and send it to us, the people who were here helped us pick it up from the dock and take it there and assemble it and then break it down and put it back. It was a nightmarish. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we can't use that venue again anyways because they redid the floor apparently and they won't even have sport court on top of it. So same, same here. That's that's what happened with the Kona venue and the Honoka yeah. venue and that's why there's no closed space in Kona for us. Yeah. I when think we, Palama too, yeah? Is that the same as Palama? Palama Nui? Palama Settlement? Yeah, that would be Oahu, yeah. Sorry, that was me. Oh, yeah, I just saw it. <laughs> I um, think they Palama redid Palama too. Just to let us skate there and then they redid it. And we were kind of excited because this huge, huge Megaplex inline hockey arena opened up in Kapolei um, hmm. with not one, but you could have two derby games going on at the same time in this arena um they have hockey games that met male hockey games there they have public skate nights with roller skates but they will not let us play roller derby there and it's it's really crazy it's like it's crazy that they won't they won't even let us offer them money and we've we've tried to offer them money but they don't want us there it's the it's something with the owner. Hmm. This is why swear words were invented. <laughs> it's like ridiculous, and and it feels very personal. Like I know, I know from conversations I've had with some of the extended family of the the people who own or the people who operate the skating rink that this is a personal thing. They just don't like us, who they don't know at all because like we're fighting or whatever throwing, crazy. Yeah. yeah you know and i'm like most of the women on my team are your kids school teachers <laughs> so right. we're getting in there one way or another you know it's just ridiculous we're all middle-aged taxpayers yeah we're middle-aged <laughs> like we're not yeah, people, fighting people. and drinking in the parking lots and yeah. like Damaging. I mean, at one point, maybe, <laughs> maybe <laughs> that was yeah. a thing. But it was Don't so long us. ago. <laughs> I mean, I think people underestimate just how I'm not going to say old, but how not. I have people being playing roller derby aren't old in their twenties, right? It's not like it's a, mm. you know a sport that's only played by people who are who are you know played by people of all ages. And I think people <laughs> sometimes underestimate that because there's a certain stereotype, as you say. Um, yeah. But I mean, has it affected other things? I mean, it's affected your venue, has it affected lots of teams? But have you found, I mean, how is, how is recruitment? I mean, how is your interaction <laughs> with the world? Mm. I mean, I, I know that obviously the teams, Big Island are, are all merging, but in general, historically, have you found that you had, have you found that Derby has worked in Hawaii as a kind of thing and Hawaii with, what people, what Hawaii's image of, of sports is like? 
I think because there's so much to do in Hawaii, you know, there's surfing and hiking and I mean, there's just so much to do here that um, maybe, so, I mean, we've had a little bit of trouble getting as big of a fan base as my old team did um, because people just are doing other stuff. Um, but whenever we go to an event on our roller skates, we always get a lot of love, but people always say, I didn't even know Oahu had a roller derby team. And we're like, oh, well, we've been here for a long time, come to a game. And um, we just got some new sponsors for our league this season. Um, awesome. Yeah, a medical marijuana company found us and <laughs> gave us some yeah. money. Or, and we're yeah. so about that. And a beer company. <laughs> so it's interesting the people that we draw in, but we're, we love our sponsors. So, yeah. I mean, it's hard to get fans, but I think it's just Hawaii is an interesting demographic and people got lots to do here. Yeah, definitely. I feel like, uh, especially being out on Kauai where we're, we're a bit smaller than all of you guys. So people's vision of roller derby here isn't that it's a legit sport yet. They still think it's like rough and tough theatrical from the seventies. And so when you recruit and they realize, like, oh, I need to go to practice two days a week. Like, this is, like, a commitment. They just, they flake out, and they don't stay with it long enough to see that, like, awesome reward at the end of it, which is the community and, like, the self-fulfillment and the confidence building and all of that. Um, so it's definitely hard to recruit because of I mean, that. The terrible irony there is that I know people who do um, amateur professional wrestling and they also practice really hard as well because it's really hard to pretend oh. you're, hitting, you're hitting people. Um, yeah. So, you know. <laughs> but yeah, no, yeah. It's, it's, it's a, it is a thing, right? Um, but I'm, yeah, so how, how have you combated that? I mean, have you just done more outreach with people or is it just a thing that's a work in progress? We still struggle with it. It's kind of a catch-22 because you want to take yourself seriously and you want to have a good team with good strategy and you want to like feel good about it. But then the more serious you are, the harder it is to keep people. But then on the flip side, if you're just like a pickup league and you have no rules and you party in the park, you don't tend to attract the kind of people that are serious about it and who will respect your, your practice space and respect other people's property. So it's like, we're, we're trying to find that perfect balance and it's it's really difficult and a lot well, of our the... community, sorry a lot of our community um outreach are things like parades and fairs um where the more theatrical we are the more we get the attention more, yeah. so we'll do like the christmas parade and we're all lit up and the tutus and all that and um you know, we, we get attention and that's a way of recruiting, but it's often, like Whiskey said, um, a little bit difficult. We also have um, a changing economy here in Hawaii and Waimea especially. When I first joined, um, the town itself was younger and more local. And now as the economy changes, this town has become older and whiter and more retired um and it, you can't afford to live here if you're an athletic 20 year old <laughs> so um you know our team definitely has changed because of that um and as more people especially people that were born here leave the islands to find um an economy somewhere else and the people that are arriving to the islands are older retirees. It's it's going to change the sport here. If it hasn't yeah. already. There's there's also the issue too of um, the less people you have in your league or on your team, the more work each one of them has to do to keep mm -hmm. the thing floating, the ship floating. So like in our case, if we actually ever have a practice where everyone's there, that means all six of us and. Um, it's really hard enough to get the athletic end of it going because that's the reward feedback for people as they show up, you get to skate, you connect with your people, you have a great time, you have to carve out time in your life for that. To then ask them to run the board, which it's still, mm -hmm. you know, something we have to operate. There's still um, parts of being a 501c3 that require attention for us to be doing um, 
out of those six people, someone's always coaching it, right? They're running, running things. If we have three new skaters, that means that one person needs to be working with those three new skaters, which means there's only probably three vets that are doing something else. So it's either all about the new skaters. It's all about the vets. And even then it's really not that many people to take in a direction. Um, so outreach is challenging because if we do a meetup, it's like a couple of us being like roller derby school, you guys should come along. You know, it's really not, <laughs> it's hard to keep enthusiasm up, you know, and it's becoming and I, more and more self-centered. Every time Maui ranked in the 200s, even though it's got eight girls who are like, get like your ranking is incredible for the amount of players you have. I mean, you play so cohesively, and it's. Our, I well, know PRD yeah. always looks at Maui like you six girls are incredible. That's sweet. <laughs> We're, well, if you only ever do a two-person drill, you get really mm. good with that one other person. You really like it's. It's kind of you know it's a double-edged sword in that mm. we um, don't have a, a deep bench. You know, like that last battle, my teammate. Um, gave me a good check in warm-ups and separated a couple of my ribs, you know, and we hadn't even played a game yet. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> she got really good at hitting me in the chest. She knows exactly where to do it because she's done it so many times. <laughs> this is, we become very intimate with each other and we learn each other's way, but we also become so reliant on those tiny little partnerships because there's no other people to put in, you know? So, um, it's, you know, when it works, it's lovely, but most of the time it's really, really hard. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, I, I feel that. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of. I can think of analogous leagues in other places that have similar kind of problems. I mean, I know that I know at least one Alaskan league that whenever they've traveled to places outside of Alaska, they've only managed to get six people to go. So they have the same kind of problem that you have. Right? That they always mm -hmm. they always play very short rosters, um, mm -hmm. which is really not optimal uh, for for Worcester Derby because obviously you have. Or a third of the roster of most of the people almost. So, yeah. yeah. Or if you end up with an injury at the beginning of the tournament, yeah, like then you're that. already, what we had to such, yeah. face down the other last time we played together. That was the conversation we were having was how to handle it. And we had already borrowed two skaters so that we could play the tournament. And immediately we were down to seven. So it was like, <laughs> what are we even doing here? Um, but we're having a great time with it. You know, we want to do it. We love it so much. So where do you decide when it's like asking too much of your small group to mm. do the parade, to, to organize the venue, to like on the big Island host the whole tournament when you don't even get to play in it. Like mm. that is mind boggling to me, the generosity that you guys have put in because of how much you love the sport and how hopeful you are that you're going to get to pick it up again on the other side of it. You yes, don't want definitely. that tournament to die. It's we huge. Know. We love it. We love it. We're gonna. You want to keep it going regardless if we play or not. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, recruitment has been such a challenge every season that goes by. It's been such a struggle to get new skaters every season. And the last time we competed, we competed with a team of I believe it was seven or eight, and. That was the last time we competed, having yeah. seven, I believe. And it was fun. We were very cohesive, but, you know, <laughs> we couldn't do it the following season. And it was, it was, I think it was five, 2019. So that's why we decided we couldn't compete. It's heartbreaking, but, you know, it allowed us to put on a great tournament and, you know, be available 100% of the time. It was great. I actually had fun doing that <laughs> and watching everyone else play. Yeah. Very sweet. I feel like we should, um, our little small pod practices, we should get together and do a class at RollerCon on how to coach small practices. And the way they talk about small leagues, they're talking like 20 people. Yeah. You know, I mean, like, how do you yeah. go to practice with three skaters where you're playing roller derby so that they can get good at it? Mm -hmm. and derby yeah. yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. I mean, have, yeah. you, have you guys considered uh, the short, fo short format variants, like survival and sevens and things? I assume you have. I mean, other than... Yeah, you know. but 
like <laughs> it's still I mean, even short form requires six people and a bunch of officials, right? And shout out to the officials, it takes 10 players oh, yeah. to play a game and it takes 14 officials. So where do we find those 14 oh, officials? Yeah. Well, that was thing. the thing I was gonna ask, was actually how, how yeah. is the officiating um, situation in Hawaii? Because if you only have limited numbers of skaters, presumably you have even less referees and uh, anything. Um, we fly, <laughs> <laughs> we fly a lot. <laughs> Um, and the, and the, um, the teams on other islands have been, I mean, a lot of our fundraising goes to airline flights so that our teams and our officials can play with each other, which is unique to our state, right? Like in order yeah. for a merged big island team to play a sanctioned game with any of the other leagues, that's a $200 airplane ticket for each person who flies in our islands. Um, and people think that Hawaii is like tiny little islands where mm -hmm. we can like just take a boat or something, but we don't have ferries. We don't mm -hmm. do any of that. We fly Hawaiian airlines every time um, and that's expensive. So again, like Sassen says, you have six people trying to fundraise for a $200 ticket each for every single sanctioned game that we would play how are you going to build a derby resume of sanctioned right. games how are you going to be ranked as a team how are you going to be certified as an official with no sanctioned games in your state um <laughs> it's definitely a problem yeah and i mean you're not alone by this being a problem with sanctioning i mean i've no. talked before to like the south african teams uh two of which are now wfd members obviously they have similar problems because of, because they're at the wrong end of the continent to all the teams in Europe, for example. So, yeah. so I think it is a thing I think WFDA are aware of and are trying to work out how to fix, but of course it's not obvious how you fix this, right? Because you've got to play someone. Yeah. Um, in terms of officiating, we're very good at officiating with a smaller crew. Um, Kauai, for instance, Jiminy is often the only referee <laughs> and his training has been doing all seven roles at the same time. Um, and when we give him a team of seven referees, he is elated <laughs> to only have to do one job. Mm -hmm. um, so we're all, all of our training has been compacted into that. So we very often run, um, we're very lucky on the big island to run scrimmages with about three officials or so. Um, uh, with that. We have some of us that have been doing it a very, very long time and we try to get players, injured players or whatever to fill in those ranks. Um, but there's a big difference in, um, there's a big difference in how you can handle a game when you have very, very beginning referees and experienced referees that are doing more than one job. Right, it's the same problem or, Sassen was talking or about. Or players who think that they know the rules when they actually mm -hmm. don't, and they're stepping in as a ref. Yeah, <laughs> you poor ref. <laughs> 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 For the worst. In 2019, we knew Pacific Roller Derby knew that we needed help, so we got Mass the ref to come out, mm -hmm. and he held a ref clinic. Um, for I think the day before the tournament. And that was super helpful. I mean, he stayed with one of our skaters and I think all of our refs um, on our on our island learned a lot to have, to, I was really glad we were able to fly someone in that we had that connection with someone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's yeah. always useful. I mean, I suppose the advantage is if you tell people, hey, come to Hawaii and also teach us, ref teach us refereeing, they're more likely to want to come than if you tell them to come to lots of other places in the world. Um, right. At least you can tempt That's the draw. Yeah. That's <laughs> totally the draw. And it's the same thing with teams that, yes. you know, that want to come and skate. It's not necessarily that, that we're in the pocket of rankings that, that are, you know, someone's target point to compete against. It's that we have this awesome vacation opportunity for them as well. And so there is the appeal in that. Um, I was going to say, as far as like sanctioning goes, our league wasn't really all that 
maybe there were a couple people at some point who were really hot on being a what did a member um, to try and play with rankings like when we had some some competitive minded people but really the reason that we went through that process was to be an option for our sister leagues to be able to play against we started feeling like we were pretty lame for not participating in the structure that helps everyone get to their goals and that's why we actually did the work to become members and so it's funny with ranking it's like we don't you know we want to play to keep our status alive but we're not necessarily all that invested in what it looks like on paper mm. um but we are we we did do that so that when we had battle of the islands we could be one of those teams that would be putting towards someone else's ranking goals or you know membership and stuff like that so even the history of that has evolved because it doesn't seem as important now that we have everyone has other options people are going to different tournaments and playing other people um yeah, yeah it's it keeps changing as we go you know pe some some teams aren't as interested in doing rankings in our state tournaments anymore because that's not usually how they do it on the mainland between state tournaments but for us that was like one of the only reasons we had the state tournament mm -hmm. was to keep everybody's membership alive back in the day so it's kind of yeah it's it's work in progress for sure so i guess we've given we've mentioned uh, big island ball a lot i should talk a bit more about your two tournaments because we do have some footage everyone to watch and we've been talking now for like 40 minutes so um i guess we just say so hawaii hosts really two tournaments every year um there's the hawaiian tournament and there's the international tournament so big island brawl has been going how long has big island brawl been going now for for some time two years three years, three years. Three years. yeah i like the ref the ref three that's a good one <laughs> but yeah I, I thought it was three years and you've managed to get i mean so you've had regular visitors from japan from japanese derby and also from yeah. But mostly from the West Coast teams in the USA, I think. Most have been your New Zealand too, yeah. New, New Zealand. Zealand. Yeah. Yeah. New Zealand. Yeah. In Canada. Canada. Oh, yeah. Those guys. My people. Those giants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how has the experience been for that? I mean, people having people from all from a relatively wide chunk of the world coming to um, coming to Hawaii to play Derby. I mean do you awesome. notice different things? It's yeah, the highlight so cool. of our season. Yeah. As a player. It's awesome. Oh my gosh. Awesome. Yeah. Oh my God. Love it. Yeah. But I mean, do yeah. you notice different things? Like, for example, I mean, you have Japanese teams and, and West Coast USA teams and New Zealand teams. Do you notice that they're different? Is it, is it yeah. a bunch of. Um, sure, I know. Right. The definitely greater than than the derby that we play so that's always welcome it's it's a challenge so of course that helps us and that's what we love about it anyway and for myself when i play against these ladies because we we've gotten to know each other so well and we're very close with them i don't like hitting them as much as if we play someone that's out of state what you know <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, like, you like hitting everybody. You know, what are you talking about? about? <laughs> but you do it anyway. <laughs> so that's how you do um, We do feel a little bit um, not only incestuous, but like distant from everything. Mm -hmm. So um, the idea of the Big Island Brawl has always been to bring in derby to hawaii because we started out knowing look it costs each individual of us so much money to go somewhere else and play derby and bring something back even to roller con and come back um why don't we make them spend the money to come out for the vacation in hawaii and get this injection mm -hmm. of derby from all over um, and look at those trends and play against those players um because we're all just feeding off of ourselves here when we would play each other. Um, so that's another thing with officiating, uh, to bring in trends with playing, to bring in plays and experience that firsthand uh, mm -hmm. while offering up this great experience. And all the players and the officials that come out say, it's a great tournament, it's in this great place, um, and that we are much friendlier 
<laughs> um, and we, we try to give them lots of things and great experiences and um, all of that. And it cracks me up because um, we hug and we kiss in Hawaii and this COVID has been a problem with that. But you know how you're not supposed to like hug the yeah. referees when they're in stripes and stuff? Mm. We just do that anyway. At the end of the games, we're <laughs> hugging and kissing and putting lays on people. And it's just how we are. We can't, and in a way shouldn't, train ourselves to not do that yeah. as long as we're consistent. So it's like, yeah, we hug and we kiss and <laughs> consistently with yeah. everybody. It's fine. Yeah. So it's, it's been great for everyone who comes out. They have a really good time. They always try to come back the next year. And it accomplishes what we wanted, was, which is to bring in all of that experience to us. Yeah. The officiating at that tournament, I think, is a really big deal, especially for the leagues like ours that don't have any refereeing, because we're just making the rules up as we go. I mean, we know them. We learn them. We don't even have a second pack to play with or practice with. So then we come to a tournament, and now we're playing a game with another team on the track. And the rules interpreted by people that actually use them frequently and are, are mm. fluent with them. And that, you know, that as conditioning is really interesting to see where we're at with our guesswork about how rules are going to be applied, about how things look. And, and I think for the teams locally that are going to travel to the mainland and try and play, like to have the opportunity to get seasoned with offici officiating that is from other parts of the world, um, can help us like handle the stress under pressure when we're on the track uh, and getting called for stuff that is like, whoa, who, me? What are you even talking? You know, the standard derby <laughs> skater response. But, but sometimes yeah. really it is an application of the rules we haven't seen yet. And if we don't get to have these tournaments close to home, you fly to the mainland, you get through an entire game before you've even caught up with how things mm. are being called. And then everyone's just like kind of devastated by it. So the officiating component of it is a really big deal for us. Yeah. This is, my, yeah. this is my personal pet peeve about roller derby is why is it not consistent globally? Because yes. there is a lot of trends and interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, and when we go some, when I go and officiate on the mainland in the tournament, there's a lot of like, well, we don't call it that way. We do it this way. And I'm like, show me where that is in mm -hmm. anything globally available online to every team. No, there's a lot of, this is just our trend in our league or in our area. And that's what the players have to get used to is these weird interpretations and trends of people trying stuff out when there's no resource for us as an isolated league to actually be on board with these trends. And if they're not standardized anywhere, there's a lot of like, oh, Derby is played by the, by the players voting on it and all this crap. That's like, um, just please give us a consistent resource that we can reach as being an isolated team. And so that the players that go somewhere, the officials that go somewhere are not subjected to these weird trends. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I, mean I, think, I think to some extent that's what the casebook was supposed to do. But I also agree that it doesn't necessarily do that. I mean, I still hear from European refs that when they, if they go to the USA to referee, they have to adjust to how they do it in the USA because there are trends that are different between the USA and Europe. And I'm not saying either of them is wrong, but they're different. And therefore, you've got to adjust mm -hmm. to whatever you're around. Um, Yay, Kitty! Um, <laughs> Hi, Kitty! I don't think that, I don't think that happens in um, any other sport, you know? like. Yeah. Football refereeing is the same all year round, you know, like, if all you had to worry about was strategy, that would be amazing. But you have to worry about officiating trends, that's a ridiculous thing in our sport. Yeah, the third team. You're always playing the third team. First, you're playing the third team, then you're playing your opponent. Yeah. So, yeah. And I hate that because it sets this up as an opponent. opponent. And what is that? Yeah. And it doesn't, you know, I think I've told you this before. I had a jam ref once um, where I felt like I had this very different experience with him refing me. And I, and I was like, what is, what is that? And he said, oh, no, my job is to keep you safe, not to necessarily try and penalize you. My job is not to make us, you know, enemies. It's to help you play this sport. And it was like, I never heard that before. And it changed my idea about what refing is supposed to be. They're managing the game for us. They're like the grandparents for us to be able to play. 
you know, yeah. and they care about her, they wouldn't do it. So to be hostile with them or feeling that they are part of the opposition is just really unfortunate, but yeah. it's kind of where we go sometimes, you know? And I think that that's comes down to inconsistency, global inconsistency, that we're allowed Maybe. these friends and it makes us an opponent instead of a facilitator. And that's so wrong. That's not yeah. just a Hawaii problem. It's an isolated know, it's a, it's a, Yeah. And I mean, even with leagues that aren't isolated, it's a problem that co goes across, you know, continents. So if you're in, you know, you're separated by geography, it's, things change gradually perhaps rather than suddenly. Yeah. So I guess I also want to move on because I know we are, I had you for a while uh, to talk about the other tournament. Um, so I am going to start sharing at this point uh, some footage. So the other tournament you have is of course the Hawaii local tournament, um, the um, Battle of the Islands. Battle. Which, so how long has Battle, how long has Battle been going for? Ooh. Sassen. Jeez. <laughs> oh. <laughs> It's 2011, um, maybe? Yeah, I'm probably three years. It probably took the about first, three years before we got it together, yeah. The first and, annual. Yeah. And Gosh, was it on Oahu? When all the teams came out, I think that's when we started. There was the one in the um, tennis stadium in Hilo. Was that 2012 yeah. or 2011? 2012, laid on the track. <laughs> they don't yeah. Right. They were often our sort of team. I don't know if we were calling it Battle of the Islands, but when all teams would come and play against each other, it was based around some sort of training camp. We used to have a, a pretty solid annual one or two training camps that would come through. And, and even though we are isolated uh, as a state, we've had some really great godparents in the sport. Um, like Dish and Ivana from RollerCon were some of my first coaches um, because of the woman who started our league. She was friends with them. And then they would bring out Camp Awesome and we, you know, that's how I met Demanda and some really great OG skaters who had a lot of love for Hawaii and for us and tried to make a point to come every year to bring some of the stuff from the mainland to us. And so we would do either pickup tournaments or like skate tournaments kind of based around things like laid on the track. Yeah. Awesome. I miss so, those days. <laughs> so the um the game I have, which I should show, can you all see the game? Yep. Yes. yes. So the game I have is the Big Island v Maui game from last year's um Battle of the Islands. Um I'm gonna start playing with no sound, but we can talk about this was I think one of the middle games in the tournament. Um spoilers for everyone who didn't uh, follow this. We did write a brief recap on the blog um, at the time, but Maui won. Um, <laughs> uh, but Maui won, I think, Battle of the Islands last year. Uh, but yes. um, but um, I'm going to start playing and then we'll talk a bit about stuff. So who's who's in which colours? Echo is black. Echo's black. Okay, Maui is green. Right. Okay, so... Um, this video is actually quite a, uh, there's no score overlay, but we'll, we'll watch stuff as going on. So are any of you present in this game? Yes. Yes. So feel, it's on the track now though. <laughs> so feel, feel free to shout out if, if and when you come on, you come on the track and stuff. But so this was one of the middle games in the tournament. Um, I think this decided because Battle of the Islands is run as an elimination tournament, right? So you, you progress to, the, to a final. Or is it a... Uh, we robin? played everybody. I think, yeah, I think it's, it's a round robin. It's a round robin, okay. Yeah, um, it, it changes each year depending on who's there and um, who's hosting and what kind of time we have as well. Um, but uh, especially this one, which didn't have seven teams, we had four teams, um, mm -hmm. and that makes a, a difference on how we play. We oh. also tend to, um, which is awesome, often create the tournament depending on the um, endurance of our skating officials. <laughs> so like we can't have two games going on at one time, for instance, even if we had had the space for that, um, because we have to give our, our skating officials some rest because we're doing almost every game. Um, I'm front IPR on this one. I'm jamming. Unless is in Mililani on Oahu and it's really really hot like really hot 
Um, we actually <laughs> thought it was supposed, it was a hundred percent chance of rain that weekend. So I was like praying every day and it, and for some, the, the rain held out and we were able to do all the games. I mean, it never got hot and sunburned, but we were able to play. So. Oh, I got, that was perfect. <laughs> I got burnt. It was so humid. I just, it was like swimming through the air. <laughs> yeah. So do you guys get used to that? I mean, you must get used to, used to the humidity and the temperature when it's in the summer or is it always a challenge? Yes, we're <laughs> but we're not used to playing multiple games a day in the heat. At least our my my team, you know, once in a while we'll do like a three hour practice, but um, it's always it's always hard when you're playing two games in one day in the sun. Yeah, yeah there's definitely strategy with training for a tournament like this if you're going to play two or three games. Well, two games in the sun. Um, how do you train appropriately for that, especially when you're made up of a mixed bag of people who are not necessarily like triathlete-minded people who want to get out there at noon and get ready for this? They're like, God no, you know. So the fact that we have one practice during daylight hours from nine to eleven on in the morning was the day that we would try and do the most back-to-back-to-back contact scrimmage to just condition our minds to be okay with it, even if our bodies were like, ah, I don't know what to do. You know, you got to season in a way instead of training around here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we we trained in Kona in the heat, um, so I think um, we were kind of prepared to play here, um, and I think we held up pretty okay. Um, yeah, we you guys have the hot in the heat. Right yeah, Kona is hot. It's really yeah. bad right before sunset it's crazy yeah, it's it's hellish <laughs> it, it cut, yeah it feels it's, it's really where the hellish. war stories come from <laughs> we had a um cooler full of ice and water um and we would dunk our jerseys in the ice water before we put them on and then put them on and played with ice cold wet jerseys um, or Smart. refereed with ice yeah. cold. Sounds heaven. <laughs> Sounds like heaven. Oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. It <laughs> wasn't <laughs> very long, but it was. It was like each time before I went out there, I was putting on this jersey, I'm like, ha, 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 and then it would <laughs> heat up in ten minutes. <laughs> there I am jamming, yeah. by the way. <laughs> oh yes. It was struggle jamming. It felt like slow motion. Mm. It was, was tough. So. It's kind of a, this is where you're looking at the Big Island um, merge team. And then our mm -hmm. team that for that game was five Maui skaters. Um, and our, our ambition was to play as much as we could, predominantly them. But <laughs> realistically, we did. I mean, everyone played the whole time. But uh, we had one, we had three, three jump-ons. One played just a couple of jams in the game against Kauai because she had not actually played a sanctioned game in her life she's still a rookie skater um and then we had a uh, whiskey from the big island we had a gal named sissy from colorado who had skated with us because she's a flight attendant and so she ended up on maui a couple times and and we got to know her and we really liked her and, and both those those skaters are excellent like top level skaters so when we talk about scores and winning and losing it's really hard to say that it was maui that um that won this game because it was a collaboration for sure and i wouldn't want to discredit those skaters are the fact that, you know, they're not our actual league members in, in how things turned out this tournament. But i um, really glad we had them because I couldn't play the last game. Uh, and these guys still pulled it off with six, which blows my mind that they didn't just pass out halfway through at that yeah. point. I was going to say, playing, playing in this heat and humidity with a roster of six or seven is, you know. Kind of stupid. <laughs> and, yet, and yet you survived. I mean, I've I've seen teams have, Derby. <laughs> I've seen teams have yeah. to play with that short roster before, and uh, several times they resorted to calling official reviews just to have some time to sit down and yeah. Just oh. get their breath. Yeah. So. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. been we one of our things. Is time management. timeouts for um, heat uh, all the time. Yeah. We're like, oh yeah, we um, mm, we need mm -hmm. to discuss something. And Thank we'll you for that. Awesome. Doing water breaks like we did a lot of official um, official timeout water breaks during this tournament 
Um, and yeah, it was yeah. part of the officiating to really watch the skaters uh, in terms of their health and to, uh, we had our medics take care of people that were getting kind of overheated and things like that. Like that's part of our job is to make sure that people aren't fainting and having heat stroke, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, there was a yeah. lot of water breaks. Yeah. Something else we've um, discussed and have used uh, occasionally is just not fielding all four because we're there to play and we want to play the game and then we yeah. can play with three, you know, we practice with three all the time. So mm -hmm. it's less fun to be the jammer in that situation, but you just play as if you've got somebody in the box, if you need to rest a person right. and that's just part of our deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was BAMS as the pivot last jam and we've got Sasson as the green jammer right here. Did I go to the right. penalty box? Oh, I'm not in there. <laughs> so, um, no, no, no. I, I think it no, says no. something in your worry that you might. There's two sitting in the box. <laughs> oh. Can't see who that is. Hmm. But yeah, so um, have you considered? I mean, I mentioned before Wait, short format games, but there's three uh, in the box now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Black fifteen playing dirt by herself. <laughs> yeah. She's a good one to have out on her own, though, man. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and that's part of the training as well. Like, the single player or just Look, she two. just blasted our jammer, just that one player. <laughs> <laughs> but nice. we don't yeah. know the position. Yeah, so what I was going to say was, um, we talked about short format before, but have you considered playing just games that aren't that aren't standard rule set for example where both teams play three blockers and one jammer make it even mm. our scrimmage be... is almost always like that we do three on three scrimmages all the time we do two on two scrimmages all the time um uh when we actually pay money to fly to each other we want it to be as realistic as possible mm. but yeah our our practices and scrimmages are short form all the time. So when we all get together, we, we want to break from that. Oh, sure, sure, yeah. Yeah, we're pretty diehard, I guess, still. <laughs> but, um, but I wonder, you know, because the, the people that I um, have taken my cues from through the decade plus that I've been messing around with this sport, a lot of them are now not skating anymore i don't really i'm not connected with the younger generation uh globally the way that i was with the og gang and so you know what they want to do with this sport is going to be what what really it turns into mm -hmm. right and i don't know if it's going to have so much to do with we want it to be like we fell in love with originally or our, our ideals of it. It may just keep on changing to be um, approachable and, and playable at this point, you know, especially for small town leagues like us. So I don't know when that torch gets handed over, you know, this group here, I don't know everyone's ages, but I've been seeing you guys around for a while. So, you know, you're still part of the, the transition period for the sport, I think. You're still part of the founder, founding group, original decade of it. So, yeah, maybe we do need to shift it up a little bit or adapt if we <laughs> want to keep going. Are you saying you tell me? <laughs> no, the derby retirement plan. <laughs> no, I just, I mean, I, you know, I, I feel like I used to pay a lot more attention. Um, uh, you know, I still am in touch with uh, a friend who plays on one of the t like top three teams. Um, and so I get like a little bit of funnel of like where this is going if people are keeping keeping the sport really sportsing. Uh, it just sounds like a, a foreign planet to me these days compared to how in the past I could see us like still sort of being a piece of that. Now I feel like we're I, even the derby that we play just feels a lot more recreational than it did um, yeah. a while right. back for me. So uh, maybe I need to shift my mind around how we play it, how many people, what the goal is, you know, not dig in so hard to like the old ways. So, I mean, do you want, can you go into that a bit? I mean, what, what do you think is different? What's, what do you think is the, has changed? Um, 
I don't know if I actually have a really good, uh, if I have the detail on that, because I think I've been not as hyper-focused on what everyone else is doing. Yeah. Um, but when I do watch tournaments, uh, like the, the high-level tournaments, things are happening so fast. And there's um, such a different level of contact now than there was a few years ago. Um, yeah, it's become really physical in a way again which you know we all wanted it to come back to that but then to the degree of what because it's getting pretty intense and mm -hmm. and that's why I wonder about the old lady derby and uh <laughs> is it responsible <laughs> what's your health insurance look like guys because yeah you know it's starting to add up a little bit for me um with breaks and such but yeah. uh but I still want to play hard you know and so where where's the line in that you know are we going to play six people for three games in the sun because we love it so much there's there's a level of danger in that depending on how well people are trained and some of my teammates only make it to half our practices so they're yeah. skating maybe once or twice a week for the weeks leading up to it and then they go into that like i don't feel very responsible i don't feel like a responsible person saying this is a good idea but at the same time it's what we all want to do so you know. I think I can address that a little bit too, as a as a team that's the Waimea Wranglers is really on the decline, um, and what happened was exactly what Stealth was talking about, exactly what Sasha started talking about. You end up with this core of players that are very serious, but to, in order to play a game, you have to bring in people that haven't been to practice recently. And you have to play your newbies, which puts them in a really dangerous situation. So I think that when Waimea stopped playing games and when um, Paradise and Hilo stopped playing games, that's where we were, is a small core of Sirius, a couple of veterans who hadn't been to practice in a long time, and a couple newbies that were not ready and were liable to get injured. And there's responsibility to your team at that point to say, hey, this is dangerous. Um, at the same sense, back when we all started and we were all new, um, I felt like I could play at that time because we were all just bumbling all over the place. But for me to go and play now after the people that I started with have become so much better at the sport, like I would be a danger to them. And uh, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be playing people of my same level. Like I would have to play with the newbies. Um, so that's a problem with our shrinking population. And already, like, on this game, we have some things going on in terms of Maui often puts out three blockers instead of the four to give somebody a rest. Um, Sasson has been doing some really uh, good clock management. Like, Maui does some really good clock management to sort of skate the back and get people out of the penalty box and... Um, not call it off until that other jammer is right behind her to stretch that clock a little bit to give them a rest. And they probably don't even think about that as being the strategy that we've developed in hot climates with six players, but it is. Um, you know, and then we only have, we have um, four referees in the middle and we mm -hmm. have mass training a skater on the outside. So we don't even have a full skating crew on this game. This wasn't the last game. Yeah, this is the, the second to last game with these teams. Yes. Um, yeah. So we've already changed the game in this state a little bit to accommodate the heat and the lack of people and the arc of training that has happened. Um, um, but I think the question that you had was, how do we see this going into the future? And that, I don't know. I mean, the other thing I was getting at, I suppose, is that um, a slightly philosophical question, um, perhaps. Um, how do we decide what serious derby is? Is it serious derby just because it's the derby that, ever, that is played by a rule set that everyone else plays by? Uh, I, mean, I mean, so I'm not saying you shouldn't want to play by both the rules. Um, what I'm saying is that, is it possible to play serious derby, but adjusting things to accommodate your own circumstances or serious derby that is also for example not for rankings or serious you know there's an interaction between serious and lots of other things i think that's exactly where we are is exactly. there, yep. you know, like um garden isle on Kauai is just sort of 
coming into WFTDA and starting as a league on that. And the rest of us are on the downcline of that, where ser serious derby for us for years has not necessarily been WFTDA sanctioning and rankings and all of that. It's just... Um, so that we could bring other teams to the island. Miles. The mm -hmm. amount of airline miles that we have to do in order to maintain just the basic level of that is tough. Exactly what Bams was saying, yeah? That we bring them to us, yeah? Yeah. But I mean, so do and, you think they'd come if, if, you were, didn't, if they didn't get sanctioned games out of it? We've had, uh, I mean, we've had people play us when we weren't ranked yet. And, yeah. um, you know, they wanted to come and have a fun game and we would do like a, a tournament well we would play them officially and then we do make a mix-up scrimmage so we get more play out of it and you know teams are willing to do that um but not to the same degree as they are if you're if you're yeah. ranked and you're ranked in a yeah. manner that shows that you're invested in it but like the truth yeah. about serious derby is that it's a full contact sport and as soon mm. as that whistle blows everyone on the track is real up and serious about what's going on whether you call oh, yeah. yourself competitive or not so it's kind of tricky. It's like you can't not play hard if you're playing roller derby because it's an insane game. So it's really right. about like what the logistics are that qualify it as serious, you know? Yeah. I don't know. And that's already, like you said, like it is serious. It has been serious our entire careers. Um, and we don't necessarily define our seriousness with the trend that the global is on mm -hmm. i know last season um for big island brawl 2019 pacific roller derby messed up our roster and ended up not being able to play sanctioned games at the mm. most important tournament that we play all year um and all the teams still played us but they had to think really hard about it because you know they want their sanctioned games and they don't want to tire themselves out on a non-sanctioned game and mm -hmm. it really complicated things for i think um the hosts of the tournament and yeah. we felt really bad <laughs> it was bad <laughs> wow. for us, for Echo, we um so we care about rankings only because we want to be able to challenge ourselves. We don't want to, I mean, we play each other all the time and, and we know what the outcome will be in the games, but we want to be able to take what we learned and play people that we haven't played before and see how we do. So that's, that's the idea with us in regards to being a WIFTA sanctioned team. It's not about getting up there because we know we never ever will. That's not the reality for us, but it's about, being able to challenge ourselves and play people who will challenge us instead of challenging or playing against one another, which we can do every day and then say, oh, look, I'm great. But actually, we're, we're just playing ourselves over and over again. So that's, that's the appeal for us with sanctions, sanction games. And also being W3 members. I mean, I noticed we've all, whenever we've talked about W3 membership, we've talked about it certainly from the perspective of, of, of leagues in Hawaii in terms of getting sanctioned games. So were any of your leagues also wanting to be WTA members for being, having the voice? Because the other reason people join WTA is to have a voice in, in how things happen, right? Yeah. Or was it, all, yeah, was, our, was it always sanctioning that was a goal for you? Our rep, our rep um, is very invested in the sport. And, and really, I feel like represents really well um, her position in the organization. Like it matters to her. It's important. And I love that she's the translator for the behind the scenes to us about that because she does care quite deeply about it. Um, but I don't know if that's the case for everyone. I feel like, you know, if it was on me to be the rep, I might be more feeling like that's a chore than it is a privilege, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, those forums are sometimes dumpster fires. It's really hard to pick out, you know, what's new. <laughs> but that's still like when you when we come up, there's still players in Hawaii right now that are surprised when I tell them that there's no longer a jammer point. Like it's not disseminating <laughs> as fast <laughs> as what? it did. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I think that's also true of a lot of other places. A lot yeah. of players 
as you've said before, a lot of players think they know the rules perhaps slightly better than they know the rules, especially when it comes to finer points of things. I mean, they all know the rules, but if you ask them for, you know, the kind of referee level tactical questions, most players understandably aren't necessarily going to be able to answer them because sure. you don't, mm-hmm. you know. A lot of the times my voice in the Woof Did Rep is slow it down, like stop making changes that we can't keep up right. with. There's exactly. no need for that. So um, a lot of the times that's the, the voice that comes out of geographically distant teams. It's just, whoa. <laughs> yeah, good point. So how many of your teams are, there's three teams that are WGA members, right, in, in Hawaii? Uh, I think we're all. I are you, are you all members then? Okay. Yeah. Yay. I think there's <laughs> only four teams ranked right now, but. Oh, that's why I was, yeah. There's only four okay. teams ranked, but there's all six are with them. Okay. okay. That's also quite hmm. impressive because a lot of, a lot of um, regions still yeah. tend to have <laughs> a few WTJ member teams and then the other leagues are kind of thinking about it or working on it. So, right. To be fair, it's that, question, but, but has uh, WIFTA put out a lax in requirements because of Corona? Yeah. Like, mm, yeah. Well, they have. Yeah, they have. But also yeah. the way membership came about, like when Pacific became members, it was like right, right. that. You know, it was so fast and easy, and then there was the eight years in between then mm. where it was really difficult, and then once most of us got in on it then they like softened it and made it easier to become a member now yeah. so it's it's been very confusing <laughs> yeah were any of you were any of you hit by the were any of you apprentices when there was the pause in the registration process and a bunch of leagues just suddenly became members without finishing their apprenticeship i think echo okay right was um i think echo was on pause with the apprenticeship and then right after that got it yeah yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It was Maui was, that, that that Maui was during the really really difficult time where they were rejecting it because they didn't like the language on something mm-hmm. of your yeah. yeah good times. <laughs> <laughs> it was like getting the nonprofit that was like right when there was a big audit of the IRS and they shut everything down and we had to wait two years and get lawyers and stuff. We have Ooh. to do everything the hard way apparently. Yeah, I think. I think a lot of it also changed because they had a lot more non-US leagues joining and of course mm. some of the conditions were phrased in US specific um, language. Not intentionally, yeah. but it's because obviously most of the leagues had joined that have been US leagues. So, yeah. um, right. PRG lost our 501c3 a couple of years <gasps> ago and um, that's part of the reason we've we even stopped trying to get an indoor venue because you can't even talk to those people without a 501c3 like indoor gyms. Um, mm-hmm. And we just got it back two weeks ago. It took us two Yay! years. Yay! Yeah. Good job. Yeah. Yay. The only like cool. good news I've, that we've had for our team in the, in the past crazy four weeks, right? Uh, good job. For non-US. It, um, it, was our, it was our finance committee. It was Slam and Scarlet, but we're super stoked. Yeah. yeah. For non uh, 501c3 is a charity, is, mm-hmm. um, so you can donate money to them. They can um, get things for cheaper, and yeah, it's a nonprofit status in our internal revenue service. So tax think, write-off for anyone who helps us. Yeah. So how hard is it for you to get that? Because I know that um, some of the it took us a really long time. Yeah. yeah. And it was expensive we- for us too. Yeah. We couldn't even talk to um, community centers and local gyms without it. Like they, the only, the first question they ask is, "Are you a five hundred one c three? No, get that and then come back. So right. maybe we'll have more opportunities now that we got it back. Yeah, yeah, use it. It's yeah. it's a good thing to have. It, I mean, it requires maintenance, like everything. You know, that's the big commitment with it. Is that. It, there are you have to have a board if you're a 501c3 you don't get to have like the option of do we want to have a board meeting as a team like there are marks you have to hit um in order to maintain that uh technicality yes. in the legal system so yeah again yeah. human resources to keep it yeah. alive and it's the kind of thing people don't think about i think when they think about costs in derby right because people think about equipment costs and i'm not sure is are there skate stores in hawaii or do you have to 
Jacob, like let's get everything from the mainland. <laughs> Oahu oh, has a skateboard shop, so like um, you could maybe get wheels, maybe bearings and mm -hmm. helmets, yeah. but no skates. No skates. Yeah. yeah. We all spend a lot of money at RollerCon trying on all the skates. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I definitely usually buy out the stock of bearings from my local skateboard shop, but everything else <laughs> is online. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, same here. <laughs> Wheels, bearings. Yeah. And shipping. Let's talk about shipping. <laughs> well, I was going to say, presumably your shipping costs are fairly impressive. We on Amazon. Oh, they're outrageous. <laughs> we did that game at RollerCon one year where it was Hawaii versus Alaska, and it had to do mm. with like the shipping requirements to get stuff to either <laughs> place. Oh, that was, that was the joke on it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> are y'all going to RollerCon this year? If it's still on? If it's still on, well, the yeah, the they didn't is. cancel it. They didn't they cancel have, it yet. Gonna post yeah, they can't cancel it yet. Yeah, they, they, yeah, they need it to be a state of, they need it to be act of God cancellation from their venue, uh -huh. yeah. which has not happened yet because it's, it's in amazing. July. So yeah, yeah, it's coming up fast. <laughs> yeah. Can in you even imagine the amount of pressure on the people that are trying to organize that right now? Mm -hmm. I can't imagine. Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean they this are basically game we've the had um, Stealth Soldier and um, Sassen <laughs> alternating a lot as jamming, and we've had BAM's Black Number Six as the Black Pivot a lot. Mm. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> uh, I, think yeah. I, I did that notice in the panel there was a little. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this game was, whew, it was a hard game for me. Um, the Maui defense was really a pain in the ass. So They're horrible. It was, They're horrible it was pretty people. hard trying to score here. And They're, on top of that, the jammers, they just, they just fuck with you. <laughs> nah. That's because I want to be a blocker. <laughs> That's me just too. wasting time. <laughs> Yeah, that's just, I mean, a big piece of that is, is just having some fun. time. Yeah, also having a little bit more fun. <laughs> but, um, but that, for me, a lot of times is like TikTok on the clock. If I can burn some time doing jammer on jammer, whether it's successful or not, it's successful or counting down seconds where I'm not yeah. having to sprint. Lazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a little bit lazy. Yeah. It's not lazy, it's clock management. Yeah. How, how <laughs> one sprint? You the, don't sprint, you float, and you glide, and you glide. Uh, lazy. <laughs> no, there was one jam. I don't know what game it was in. It might have been this one where Naden was jamming. And she hit the pack and then turned around and started doing some, like, jammer D in the pack hmm. just to rest while both jammers oh. were in the pack. And then was like, oh, yeah, I got my breath. And then kept going. And I'm like, what is she doing out there? Just being a jerk. And it was like, <laughs> their resting was to join her blockers, yeah. mess around a little while, and then take off. And I'm like, oh, it was fun. Was, yeah. Oh. Yeah, we're yeah. weird. She, she, she could have been more horrible to, the, to her pivot and just pass the star instead. She would never do that. She would pass <laughs> the star. <laughs> but there's a typical that Maui. <laughs> typical Maui stunt that works most of the time. <laughs> it's it's confusing. We we like to incorporate confusion into what we're doing because that's like one thing that's free and easy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't have to train hard for it. It will be weird just to try stuff out because we never really get to skate against a, we're never in a group. We don't ever practice in packs. So it's all experimental <laughs> when we show up, you know. Mm -hmm. But I mean, so it's can, all philosophical. But sometimes <laughs> that can be a good tactic, right? Because if, if everyone, yeah. I mean, if everyone, for example, if certainly you play people from, from the mainland, um, people have tactics, right, that everyone learns from everyone else. So if you're not playing that meta, then obviously um, it sometimes can be an advantage, right? Because they don't know what to deal with. Mm. Um, mm. It's the same thing how um, for a long time and still sometimes now, when European teams go across to the USA for the first time, they tend to do a lot better than expected. And I think some of that's right. just because, you know, inevitably the US and European methods are slightly different. Yeah. Yeah. Being unpredictable, whether you're trying to or not, that's, that's how it works out, you know, to some degree in your advantage, I think. 
and it's more fun for us when we try something yeah. weird. It just sort of takes <laughs> the pressure off of the seriousness, and that's helpful. And hopefully, we're entertaining yeah. the refs while we're at it. <laughs> yeah, it is entertaining. It's fun trying to outsmart them. Yeah, you just got to outweird us. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, you guys always win. We're just the freaks on this side, all <laughs> Peach and her clown show stuff. But it's, it it oh, keeps yeah. us, it keeps our mood up, you know. Yeah. Because those games are hard. They're really hard. It's there's there's no it joke. Is. It's always hard. So to have some yeah. kind of playfulness in it helps us psychologically. It's interesting too to see the strategies that you've worked on you know, a hard all season and everyone on your team knows the strategies so they know how to shut them down. And you're like, is this going to work with players who don't know what we're about mm. to do? Mm. Um, and usually, I mean, they usually yeah. figure it out pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's also a mark of a really good team, though. I mean, adaptability to um, weird and unusual stuff. Because um, I think as you get, sometimes you get good teams that aren't the best that aren't you know there's really there's good and there's awesome and part of one of the differences can be the awesome did really good the good teams are good at playing whatever they're expecting and really awesome teams are good at adapting to something that they weren't expecting um there we go <laughs> so i guess i guess um, i guess the elephant in the room is will there be a Battle of the Islands this year. I hope so. It all depends on our government if they if they allow because what's happening right now is if you fly into the states you have to quarantine for fourteen days. That's the mandate same. that's happening right now. Yeah, yeah, so, same inter island yeah. right now still too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we we have the venue. We just don't know. I mean, it's up in the air because of that. And we're on lockdown right now. Right now. There's no oh, yeah. events. Well, I know there's nothing now, but I mean, so Battle of the Islands has always been a little later in the year, right? Because right. Uh, September, oh, September, or yeah. October. Yeah. Like so, fall. Because I know that um, Big Island Brawl was al is always the earlier in the year, and then Battle of the Islands is later. So. Um, yeah. I mean, how confident do we feel? I know that we. I know that predicting governmental responses to things, and indeed everything is hard, but. Are we at the moment crossing our fingers and hoping? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> there was yes. the year where the Battle of the Islands, uh, we had a hurricane during that. That was when <laughs> oh, yeah. Hurricane. Yes. And there was a hurricane and they turned the gym into a shelter. Um, mm -hmm. And we met up like a month later with smaller teams to get it done. So something yeah. will happen. Yes. Okay. We cool. hosted that year. Yeah. The hurricane ruined our plans. Stressful. <laughs> but yeah, it's also impressive that you could work around it, right? I mean, perhaps some company yeah. might have just cancelled the event. I mean, I, I feel like if we can't get it, get it in September, maybe we could push it off to November, December. Sure. Um, that's, that's the goal. Possibility. Yeah, that's the goal. So right now we have it reserved for September. There's two different dates in September. And of course, it's dependent on what's happening with the state and if yeah. even the, the gym will open or not. Because the gyms are closed, yeah. So yeah. if they'll open later on and they open up travel, then yeah, we're definitely going to have it this year. We need Derby in our lives. Mm. <laughs> yes. so, and how are you feeling about being in shape for it? Because obviously, presumably, none of you can, none of you can be practice as teams right now either. So. Right. I mean, competitively, are you feeling like... Well, the good you... news is we're all even. <laughs> well, that's true. Um, <laughs> we're doing we off cross training, you know, whatever you can do at home. Uh, yeah. Basically, every day doing something, even getting on skates. I've been able to just get on skates and do footwork stuff in my garage. Um, yeah, just trying to stay on it. We've been asked to keep up our endurance and do that as well. Like just, if you can in your garage, just work on your footwork and stuff like that and keep fit, work on your core, whatever you can do within the small space that you have. 
all the skates have outdoor wheels on them. Uh, <laughs> I was say, meanwhile on Maui, our defense is just putting on pounds. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> that's everybody oh, yeah. we're all yeah. playing that game now <laughs> i'm scared I'm scared to go back to practice <laughs> have any of you been doing have any of you been doing um kind of uh things like you know video group video practices or anything i know some leagues have been doing things like having virtual coaching sessions um over things like like zoom and um, skype and things or we had an echo D meeting over Zoom mm -hmm. for all our board to talk about what was going on and make sure everybody was doing okay. Mm -hmm. Does drinking cocktails together count as team, <laughs> team building? We did that. It's, it's team Four bonding. That counts. That. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and then Echo, that, that great video um, that Echo did where they were passing the masks, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was great. I actually um, asked our coach if she could start Zoom practices next month to see how it goes. Um, so we might try it out next month um, just to get back on and, and get in touch with everyone and see how everyone is doing and just, you know, get it going again, regardless if we have to social distance um, for the time being. Yeah, because I think, I think people talk about, I mean, we talk about the competitive aspect, but also a Royal Derby League is also a community and sometimes it could be useful just to have ways of keeping yourselves in touch with each other as people, not just mm -hmm. people on screen. Yeah, yeah, my mental is all messed up right now without Derby taking the edge off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's weird for sure. Yeah, all of a sudden I'm a surfer. It's the strangest <laughs> thing. Because <laughs> you can still surf here, uh, oh, it's... you know. Oh, no. because of course it's a solitary activity so it's yeah yeah well globally it's pretty much shut down most other countries it's considered criminal at this point um okay. but hawaii's still civilized and allows people to paddle out on a surfboard so so i've been doing that instead of the wheels but um that doesn't keep me connected with my team and a totally different muscle group so mm -hmm. Yeah, you're on your edges. It totally counts. <laughs> My balance. With cross is training. Good. <laughs> yeah. I've been yeah. doing a lot of hip work. Do the cardio. Yeah. For the core. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You got to do something, you know? Yeah. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Keep the body moving every day. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, Obviously, the game's finished. Murray won. Murray did also win the tournament. Um, uh, but yes. Um, I th I, yeah, so um, that wasn't... I think the closest game in the tournament was actually one of the earlier games. Um, but actually, that was a fairly close game, considering the fact that... Um, you're happy to it was a pretty good game. There was a, <laughs> a one-point jam, there right? Was a, there was a one-point game. Um, that was uh, yes. Oahu. EFD Kauai. Yeah. yeah, that wow. was yeah. nail biting. Oh, that was brutal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, PRD didn't win any games that tournament, but I will say when you're hosting the tournament, sometimes your head isn't right. all in the game because you you just want everyone to you know people spend so much money to come. Mm -hmm. You want everyone to just have a good time and all the refs to be taken care of. You know, you just want a lot of other things. Yes, right? definitely. Um, can I call out BAMS as being part of Team Indigenous? And um, you certainly can, yes. I want to, what are you, the second Hawaiian on I Team Indigenous? Am, well, we just, we took on five more skaters. So two, one, two. One other one that we took on was Hawaiian. I think you guys remember her from RollerCon. Sassan, you remember Hawaiian, yeah? She played on our Hawaiian Island ladies team. We yeah, have her really now. Cool. So there's actually four of us. All nice. three of them live on the mainland, and then I'm the Hawaiian here in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of nice. Other uh, Polynesians on the team. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, um, yes, yeah, obviously. Uh, so what do you, can you say what's planned for Team Indigenous? this year because obviously usually you know, business to play a game at rollercon but of course we right. don't know if rollercon is happening 
Oh, no. We're uh, actually supposed to be playing the Black Dys Dysphoria team today. Yeah. It was supposed to be happening at the, the other Chaos tournament that's happening. So right now we're kind of bummed because that's mm. that was another Aww. opportunity for us to have, have played together. Yeah, and our our leaders have been working really hard to try and find games and tournaments for us to play in and participate in. So there was two that we were going to participate in and one we we weren't able to because of the numbers and this one of course got canceled because of covid so we're hoping we took on five with hopes that RollerCon will still happen and there's more tournaments that we can play in in the future i was trying to get them to come here to hawaii because it would be cool to have team hawaii which um Sassen was actually the the captain of play Team Indigenous, which is something that we could incorporate into battle or big and bra in the future <laughs> or, or something. Yeah, no, that's, that, that sounds like a really good thing. And I mean, not wanting to add even more complexity, but the other thing, of course, would be you've had substantial components of Team Japan come to Hawaii before. So mm -hmm. there, were other, there were other teams that wouldn't find it that hard uh, to get to Hawaii <laughs> if you wanted to have right. a team. <laughs> right. I mean, there's a team. There's a team in Bali now, so you know, invite them across. Oh, um, that's cool! I saw it on your page. That's cool. Yeah, there's a, there's no, actually it, there's almost a team in Jakarta, but I'm not sure if they've got going before all the COVID the COVID nineteen mm -hmm. stuff. But there was it. There were some people thinking of having a team in Jakarta. Awesome. Um, this this has cool. me wonder though. Is it like um, the way that the Japanese team is mostly like expat military people? You know, is the Jakarta uh, no. team going to be a bunch so, of expat, or is it actually Indonesian the team in, people? The, the team in Bali was founded by one person who is not Indonesian and one person who is. Um, okay, and cool. They are mostly recruiting people who are uh, who are Indonesian. Um, right. Which is because I've seen the skate scene there is pretty hot in Bali. Oh yeah. Uh, right. That was yeah. that's been a big thing for them. Is actually the skate scene is a big thing because yeah. in a lot of places in East Asia it isn't, and that's an, an additional problem for um, recruiting. And for them, it's yeah. been a, it's been lucky, not so much the hitting people on skates thing, and it's mm -hmm. been a more male dominated um, skate scene than a female dominated skate scene. Mm -hmm. But they've so, managed yeah. to get a lot of out of it. Yeah, at least you break the mental barrier about it being a thing that's exactly. acceptable in the first place. So you've got that part paved, which is great. Yeah, I just wonder about that, like with having um, Team Indigenous brought up how, you know, if Team Indigenous came to play Team Hawaii and Team Hawaii is like predominantly Howleys, it's just always slightly <laughs> conflicting, um, you know? I mean, if you live in a place where you're you're a visitor, even if you're a resident, just by nationality and being american you're still an invader here so it's kind of like um i just wonder about when i think about teams from japan or from new zealand and yeah yeah from indo if it's going to be uh like we would love to have more local people on our team you know and there's almost this sort of stereotype that there would be a bunch of titties that want to like throw down and come and play mm -hmm. like people talk like that and i'm like We've had some. We've had some local girls. You know, our oldest member is local, and we've and we've had uh, quite a few born and raised people. But it's not the representation that you would that we would hope to have. And and how do we actually become more inclusive in that way? How do we attract um, diversity on that level? Because it tends to be, you know, the echo chamber thing that happens. And uh, it's going to be my friends of friends, people that I work with in my industry, which happens to have less local people in it because it's sort of catered towards Hollies. So mm -hmm. how do but, we... But that's Hawaii now, those Sassin. I mean, yeah, Hawaii is a melting pot. That's what Hawaii is. I'm not pure Hawaiian. I'm Hawaiian, Chinese, Irish, English. So, I mean, that's what Hawaii is now. It's not Team Hawaiian, it's Team Hawaii. So... Yeah. I don't see a problem. With that, yeah, I know for Pacific Roller Derby, we are majority military, so either in the military or a spouse of in the military, and that's why our teams change so much because we, mm. our girls leave our skate, excuse me, our skaters mm. leave every three years. Yeah. Um, and we have like we lost five girls uh, skaters last season, and we're losing I think three this season. So it's it's hard. When it's all military, yeah. 
Yeah. Even though we love the military, or we love our military skaters, it's just, you know, they move a lot, and that's hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, that can be, a, that, 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 that's in a sense, a brutally pragmatic reason to try and recruit more people who are, you know, who are locals or, yeah. or Hawaiian, because you get a more, perhaps, consistent set of people that aren't being reassigned every two years. Because um, mm-hmm. I know there's been a problem for Okinawa as well. We're talking about right. um, Japanese leagues that are predominantly military. Um, but um, I mean, Japan is improving. Uh, there are there are leagues in Japan that are uh, actual Japanese native Japanese people. The predominant the majority of the league. Um, mm-hmm. so, um, it is uh, a thing that is improving. Of, a member of Echo is uh, part of Team Japan. And she goes over to Japan and plays with them a lot. And she yeah. said that they started out kind of being theatrical and tutus and definitely the bank track team in yeah. um, Japan is a old school mm-hmm. um, theatrical production. And now yes. it's becoming more competitive and they played at RollerCon in the, in the nation one with um, very little military, like you have to be born yes. in Japan to be part of that team now. Mm, yeah, that's cool. Um, it's been a very positive thing. It actually has been genuinely positive, and it's happened surprisingly quickly in a way. Um, there's been a change that's happened over the last couple of years that's been released. Um, so it is a thing you can do. Um, it just, I think it first takes you to notice there's a problem and then think about why it's a problem, and, you know. Mm. And some of it be really hard to work out why it's a problem. Are there roller derby teams on Sky or uh, on the in the Scottish Islands? Uh, there, there used <laughs> there was an attempt at founding one in Shetland, which eventually sort of faded because they couldn't get a consistent enough bunch of people to practice. Uh, there is currently a team on Orkney. Um, there are no teams on the Western Isles. Um, the populations are too low, I suspect, to mm-hmm. actually maintain it. Um, so um, I think that's a population issue, really, rather than anything else. But Orkney, Orkney have a team, and they have the same problem in microcosm that you lot have, in that uh, getting from Orkney to even to anywhere on the Scottish mainland is surprisingly expensive, let alone getting anywhere that isn't the Scottish mainland or somewhere, somewhere else. So it's a travel problem for them, um, rather mm-hmm. than anything else. Because um, they can either take a ferry that takes uh, the best part of a day, or they can fly, which is incredibly expensive. It's, genuinely, it's about as expensive for them to fly to Aberdeen, or uh, which would be the closest airport in Scotland, as it would be for someone in Aberdeen to fly to like southern Spain. In fact, it's actually more expensive for them to tra- travel there than it would be for someone to tra- fly to southern Spain. So. Yeah. It's sometimes like that here, them? where mainland flights <laughs> are cheaper. Yeah. Do you skate, Sam? I do not skate. I just write about Derby. Um, and plan things. Um, if you want to complain about the World W World Cup, I designed the last one. So I do that kind of thing. Um, wow, no complaints. Consistency <laughs> and <global laughs> officiating. Wow. I cannot. I can't. I can't Fantastic. tell the officials what to do. Um, but so yeah, you're an I, architect of roller derby. I started off writing about it, um, and then decided that I, if I was going to write about it, I might as well get involved in other things about it as well. So I did video for a long time. And, um, what started your interest? Uh, I attended a game. Uh, the first game I attended was a game I was invited to because uh, a friend of my partner and I um, from the university was refereeing uh, the game. And uh, she actually refereed at the time, refereed Berlin. And okay. they came across to play Old Vicky. Um, Edinburgh's team and um, she did the traditional thing of people at the time this was in late 2010 of doing the whole hey look there's a sport you probably haven't heard of and I'm coming over to, and my team is coming over to play this thing and everyone I know should come and see it immediately and just come and see the thing so we read this whole thing um, and I was, it was actually a really good game talking about one point games it was a one point game um, oh, cool. so um, possibly the best the best way of getting involved in the sport is to see a really exciting game first off Mm-hmm. Cool. And I was sitting on the. Fr- I got to sit on the front row because her partner was also got to sit on the front row because visiting refs, of course, get people to 
visiting refs and, um, and skaters get front row privileges. Right? So, but no, it's, it was good. So, um, and it's been nine years now. So. Yeah, well. well, thanks um, for your contribution in all of this. The the people that hold it together so we can play. It's a big deal. Well, it wouldn't, it, well I mean, I think everyone everyone yeah. in this call is very committed. Otherwise, you wouldn't have decided to stay on a call for two hours um, talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, that thank note, you, we, Sam, for putting this all together for us and letting us all be together in one space, still connected. It's, it's, it's my pleasure and hopefully we're going to do more of these so I'm going to shout out to people watching this we do want people from other regions to do these I'm, I'm talking to people from a bunch of regions about doing them but there's no limit to how many we can do so if you do want to feel like you can spend an hour and a half two hours of your time talking to me about Derby then please do because I think everyone here has, has enjoyed this as a, as a experience yes thank you and hopefully thanks cool. want us to talk about derby oh all right <laughs> all day long 24 <laughs> 7 <laughs> and hopefully people watching this get a an appreciation for hawaii and derby in hawaii and how it's the same but different yeah you know there'll be everywhere else you'll let us know when yeah. you post it i will this will this will go up uh probably before the end of Monday, your time. Cool. Oh, thanks. But for now, um, I think I should call this shut. That's sure, otherwise we'll be talking for another hour. So um, thank you all for coming. Um, <laughs> sure. I'll I should wave, wave, wave to the audience. So uh, thanks everyone for coming. This has been Derby in Hawaii and the thanks, end guys. of the third podcast. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Aloha. Cool. Aloha. 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 Aloha.